All right, welcome back, everyone. This is episode number six, six, yes, number six of the Odyssey podcast. I'm joined, of course, by Connor Campbell, Coach Campbell on Instagram, and Odyssey Strength Coach Clarice Tig. Clarice, say hello. Hello, everybody. How are we? <laughs> so, why don't we jump right in, Clarice, and and start off with a little bit of an introduction? Obviously, you're an Odyssey Strength Coach for 14 months, exactly. Isn't exactly, it? exactly, exactly. It's crazy how quickly the time has flown. It's mad. It's mad. But anyway, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about what you do outside of powerlifting, who you are, what you enjoy, your hobbies, your interests, etc. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Well, as you've already said, powerlifting coach by night, but by day, I am a trainee accountant. <laughs> I've been working now in industry for coming up on two years. Graduated from from Galway in UI, did, did commerce with accounting there. And that's pretty much my life at the minute, really, swapping between accounting during the day powerlifting coach any free time I have um, <laughs> and in the in the middle of exams then as well obviously because I have to do those for for the chartered uh, degree so yeah that's that's pretty much me at the minute how did you get what? into I, I know how you got into to powerlifting Greece but could you give us a a bit of a, a background to your your sporting background were you sporty as a as a kid good question actually so um was I sporty? Yeah, I was playing a lot of like football, camogie, soccer when I was fairly young, but I was always a very, I was, I was, I was a chubby girl, like and I'll say that, that I was. So the way I got into powerlifting was kind of not your, your typical way. Like I started off and um, I wanted to get into the army. That was actually what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a PT in the army. So one day, like it just kind of clicked in me. I was like, do you know what? I'm going to cut myself on out. I'm going to stop eating all the shit. Because I used to have like every lunchtime, it was a can of Coke, two purple snack bars and a bag of chips. <laughs> that was my diet every day. So I was like, do you know what? I'm going to stop that. I'm going to cut myself on out, go out for runs and the whole shebang. And while my intention was good, the result was shit. I fell into a, a, an eating disorder um, and I went from like a size 14 to a 10 in the space of it was just two months I think so it was a lot of weight lost very very quickly and I continued that throughout my leave insert because I guess with the leave insert with all that I studied it was very easy to to hide that because I was in my room studying the whole time anyway so it was very easy to go unnoticed in in what I was doing so I kept doing that until like college so two years where I my, my diet like consisted of I think a max 300 calories a day because I would just eat like two bowls of cornflakes that was my thing and obviously like as with everything I reached a point where I stopped losing weight and I was just plateauing so I, so I thought you know being the idiot I was at the time I was like well I'll just hire a personal trainer and I'll just lose some weight that way and that'll be excellent so I did actually I hired a personal trainer and he obviously took a food diary of, of what I was eating, spotted that I was eating absolutely nothing and was like, look, okay, we have a, we have an issue here. So I have to say like he, he definitely guided me in the right direction at the right time and helped me fall in love with the idea of being strong as opposed to being skinny. So that's what kind of flipped the switch in, in my head. And then at the time, I was joining um, the Olympic weightlifting team in NUI Galway, where is where well, that's where I went met uh, Connor's brother Neil, and the rest is history. Like I fell into powerlifting from that, just from from talking to him, getting to know other guys in the gym, and just when you see other people in the gym being super strong, I don't know, it was just a good, it was a good place for me in in my recovery from like an eating disorder, but like it wasn't an overnight recovery or anything. Like I it was a couple of years going on. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely the the thing that that flipped in 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 my brain was just the idea, of, and it was a slow progression. But the idea of just being strong as opposed to being skinny, and that's yeah, as I said, took a couple of years. Like when I started lifting first, I think I was fifty two kilos, and I'm like five seven, and I weigh like seventy six now. So that'll give you an idea of how the last three three years or so in three or four years in lifting have just kind of transform wow. me like in more ways than one so that's you're how i got a, into lifting 
you're a very healthy happy 76 as well like you're very comfortable oh yeah that. oh like that's yeah. where i should be like any lower is just not not great for me mm-hmm. yeah 100 percent. why don't you tell us a little bit about your kind of athletic background with regards to powerlifting how did you how did you get into powerlifting how did you make the, the transition from weightlifting to powerlifting what was your first competition like etc first competition <laughs> definitely a coaching <laughs> moment as well <laughs> oh like oh jesus the memories so yeah, like I was just doing eye lifting with the club, but at the same time, I could, there was obviously a lot of powerlifters in the gym. So as I got more friendly with them, I was kind of trying it out. And IVs in, I think it was, it must've been Dublin somewhere, but IVs came up in 2018, I think. Was it 2018, Connor? It was 20, oh shit. 2017, I think 2018. it must've been 2018, yeah. 20, yeah. And uh, it was like, a month before or two months before and I was like sure I'll give that a whirl sure I'll try that (laughs) and signed up Connor's brother Neil handled me on the day and sure I hadn't a clue what I was doing but I gave it a whirl and there's something about it like you just catch the powerlifting bug I feel like when you do your first powerlifting competition you just the vibes not it's not even the weights on the bar anything that you do like in terms of positioning or anything it's just the vibes, the people you meet, you're like, this is great. You're like, this is what I want to do. And then, yeah, like next thing you know, a couple of months later, I chat to yourself, Adam, and, and here we are. It was our first meeting was, was it at, it was Junior Nationals 2018 or was it? Um, yeah, yeah, it was July. Junior Nats. Junior, junior Nats. Nats. Yeah. Again, I was like, I haven't a clue what I'm doing. Uh, poor Neil was, was handling me. But I'm like, I'm, I'm awful to handle, I think. And I was like, I don't know what to do with my warm ups or my openers. And I think Neil got advice from yourself. And uh, yeah, that was our first interaction. I was like, this this stranger helping me out. This is this is the guy I need coaching. It's actually mad to to think back to that because like I haven't thought back to that moment until right now. Mm. And the the difference in in even just who you are as a person between then and oh, now yeah. is is nuts. And all you know, all through your own experiences, but you were super nervous that day Am oh fact right in saying that yeah 100 i was shitting bricks going into that yeah. like i was just i almost felt sick i was so nervous but which is which is mad to think because i think your next competition after that was september ulsters right it was ulsters, september yeah. 2019 yeah where you could not like nervous was not even a word that enters that equation no i was loving life i was bopping around like having having a bop in the warm-up room like you did you, i didn't look like someone that was competing i looked like someone that was about heading a night out like i was just <laughs> vibing in the corner to my music <laughs> yeah that was yeah that was an incredible competition so much fun for everyone i think oh yeah so that was your last powerlifting competition yeah um we were prepping what competition were we prepping for when when things kind of went south it was galway yeah it was galway yeah yeah connox i guess we'll we'll move we'll move into that we'll move smoothly towards that so so why don't you tell us a little bit about what what happened in the lead up to that competition and the, the ensuing I suppose diagnoses and, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose I'll track back a little bit first pre ulsters because that's when things kind of kicked off, I suppose. Um so yeah, it's actually almost almost just over two years ago now. It was February twenty nineteen. I had my first, I guess what we now know to be an MS relapse. Um but a bit about that. I was working in the gym, uh it was Saturday, I felt awful, like I felt like I'd been hit by a bus or something, just the fatigue. I can't even describe it. It, it. it was insane. And my legs felt super weak and I had to keep like going up and down stairs just for clients and whatever else I was at. And I couldn't, I couldn't hold myself right. And one of the, one of the members in the gym, she said to me, she was like, you look awful. Like you should, do you want to sit down or whatever? And I went down to the manager and I sat down. I just thought I was going to faint or something. So they were like, oh, you know, we'll give you some water. So I was just drinking the water sat down she was like oh we'll call your mom in and we'll go go to the doctors or whatever so call my mom in and my manager and my mom like they both grabbed me by my shoulders to help me out of my seat and they get the they stand me up and once they let go of me I fall back into my chair like I can't feel my legs move my legs like there's just nothing there and 
I, I roared. I roared at that point. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with my legs? Like I was screaming. People in reception were like, what's happening? Um, so gathered my thoughts, paused for a second. And I was like, no, no, let me try again. So they both helped me up. But the same thing happened again. As soon as they let go of my arms, I fell and I went back into my chair. So they just got the wheelchair, brought me to a and was seen to straight away in Banlaslow, um, in, in the department there. And they actually diagnosed me at the time with a syndrome called Guillain-Barre syndrome. So it was basically like my immune system just attacking my peripheral nerves. And at that point, they, because of the, how quickly it was progressing, like it had started in the very lower portions of my legs, like it was in my calves, and it was right up in my hips then by the time I got into A&E. And um, because of that progression and that upwards progression, they 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 talked to Beaumont Hospital. And because of just the way I was presenting, I suppose, they diagnosed me with Guillain-Barre syndrome and told me that, look, I was at risk of going into a coma. So they had actually prepped me for ICU. And I was alone in the hospital at that point, And I had no phone. It was because my battery was dead. And I didn't have any phone charger. And now anywhere I go, like I'll always bring a phone charger. But anyway, FYI, always bring a portable charger, people, because you never know when you'll need it. Um, so yeah, they diagnosed me with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And that was February, February 2019. Come out of hospital. And obviously, like the first thing I want to do is, is get back into lifting as soon as I can. But they put a ban on me lifting until I had seen a neurologist. So in the meantime... While I was waiting for that appointment, I was seeing a fantastic physio in Galway and I, the program I was doing for physio, it was four, four times a day, every single day for, I think it was five months, um, five months that I was doing that. So it was May, May time. I got a appointment with a neurologist in Galway as well. And he actually said, no, it's not Guillain-Barre syndrome. You have a transverse myelitis. So I'm like, cool don't know what that is but he gave me the okay to lift so I was like Adam we're signing up for Ulsters in September like let's do it (laughs) and that was May so I had like June July August to number one be able to walk in a straight freaking line again and walk upstairs number two put a bar on my back and then number three try and PR at a competition so like I don't know what I was thinking but you know what we did it and Ulsters was it was the best competition of my entire life pretty sure I cried no I did cry after it I'm pretty sure there is we all cried at it it's okay shout out to Finn for being there for all of my my tears on the day as well but uh yeah so two days after Ulster's then I was kind of feeling the same thing in my legs like I was getting super weak and I just I I I knew it was the same thing but I tried to put it off because I just I didn't want to go back there again um but a couple of days after that, like I, I was, I was goosed and I was in A&E again in Waterford and a whole lot of tests were done then because I mean, no one had a clue what in the name of God was wrong with me. So I had two lumbar punctures there. I had MRIs, uh, the whole works and they kind of dipped their toes in many, many diagnoses. Adam, you'll remember this because I remember talking to you about it. They told me it was like psychosomatic they told me it was a mess and they told me it wasn't a mess and it was actually Guillain Barry and then no it's not Guillain Barry it's transverse myelitis and I'm like can someone just make up their minds and treat me like so eventually came out of there and they didn't reach a conclusion on what was wrong with me so they sent me back to the original neurologist I had seen in Galway so got an appointment with him in November 2019 and he kind of just took a look at I guess all the reports that I had and MRIs and and whatnot and he just said that there is no other possible diagnosis but multiple sclerosis and and that's the way he said it Um, and that was that was that and and here we are like almost a good year and a bit later post-diagnosis it's crazy it is mad yeah it is mad um Obviously, I know, so it feels a bit strange asking these questions, but how, how, how has that affected you? Like, how has that affected, you know, your ability to, to move, your ability to train your life in general? Uh, what has the effect been? And I suppose, first of all, let's start with what even is MS? What, what, does, it, yeah. what does it do? 
Yeah, so MS, for anyone that doesn't know, is a condition that affects your brain and your spinal cord. And I guess what happens really is your immune system just attacks your myelin sheet. So that's like the protective layer around your nerves. And it just causes a miscommunication between your brain and the rest of your body. So, yeah, like it's it's lifelong. There's no cure, but there is fantastic research going on right now. And like in the grand scheme of things, I'm very lucky to be alive in the time that we're in where we have all of this available um, and then in terms of how it affected me the first like that first relapse I had from in February 2019 that whole time of the physio and you know prepping for competition again I was I, looking back now I think I was in denial um, because I don't know what the like what the hell would drive someone to go from being paralyzed to competing like I, I was mad and um, but that, like, I, I, yeah, it didn't phase me. I never thought of it as, oh, poor me, you know, this is really shit. This is an awful time. I just kind of got on with it. And I think, like, and Adam, you can definitely um, attest to this as well. That time off lifting to literally just relearn how to bodyweight squat, relearn all of the small things. I, when I did come back lifting, when I did have a bar on my back again, I was a completely different lifter. Like that time off to focus on such small things, like, as I said, a bodyweight squat or my core or walking upstairs, like all of those little things. When I did have a bar on my back again, I moved better than I ever have in my life, like in, in, in anything. Um, so like I, I'm very, very grateful for that physio that I had. She was phenomenal. And obviously yourself and Adam as well, like when we did get to start programming again, like we took it. I think we were very smart in in the approach that we took for that competition. Like we were purely just focused on, you know, health, movement, screw the weight, whatever happens in the day happens. Like the, the goal of that competition was purely just to compete. So anything after that then was the, the cherry on top. So that was like mentally, dare I say, not phasing at all. Like I wasn't phased by it. Even being told I was going into a coma, I was like, this isn't great, but I mean, you know, I best ring my mom and tell her what's going on. Like, I wasn't phased by it. And looking back, like, that's ridiculous. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. I clearly wasn't. Um, but then the second time, the second time was awful. And I think you'll remember, like, those are prob- that was probably the worst couple of months training wise for me ever like I don't think I, I didn't enjoy training at all I hated it I think I was mad that you know I'd put so much work like hours and hours and hours of small tiny exercises and I was just so mad that I had kind of just lost all of that all of that progress was just thrown up in the air and I had to restart everything again like that was hard I was so pissed and I like, and it's terrible for me to even admit it now, but I was looking at everyone else being able to progress. And I was like, why the fuck can't I do that? And I felt so, yeah, just really shit, to be honest. Excuse the French, but it's it's, it's necessary sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I just, I, I, I hated, I hated training. I don't think I had, every session I had, I always had something to hate about it just a completely negative and um, unhealthy approach to, to training for for months and what changed that then was I think it was the December comp that you did Adam uh, and all the Odyssey gang were there and I had another relapse there it was obviously a milder one but I'll, I'll never forget it like it because it was the the first kind of public display of oh well here's Clarice being disabled you know, like I couldn't, we try to get up for a picture and I couldn't feel my legs. And, um, sorry, I actually get emotional thinking about it because obviously I love our team and being, not being able to stand up there with you guys broke me. And I was like, fuck, I'm disabled, you know? And that was like important self admittance to me. And that is when I changed both as a as a lifter but more importantly as a person that's when I kind of realized like look I need to take a step back here and seriously reevaluate like my perspective on on life like it sounds so 
cringy but you know when you're in that kind of position you do have to take a step back and think you know what's important here is it weight on the bar or is it me being able to walk or me being able to live and it was obviously the latter so that that was a game changing point for for me for my life for now my athletes because I approach things in such a different perspective than I think I ever would have had I not had that moment and obviously the support I got from all of you guys not just on that day but like throughout the whole thing that plays a huge I think the, the support network you have going through something like that I think seriously determines the outcome of that situation so like you know Nathan and Finn and Katie like Nathan needing to like hold me and just run me down the streets of Limerick to the Airbnb like little things like that will forever be in in my my mind like that's that support on on another level um definitely made me who who I am today 1000% I don't doubt it incredible it's it's um yeah it's super like to, to hear the story laid out like that uh, to, to, I, I suppose I haven't really reflected on it like until right now in, in, in its entirety. It's just, it's insane. You are by far one of the, the strongest people I've ever met. And I don't care about weight on the bar, as you mentioned. That's an irrelevant <laughs> metric here. When I, This is yeah. a different kind of strength, you know? And, and you, you, you know, you talked about the kind of ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. Uh, like I remember going into that September competition, how fantastic training was. And you attribute it, largely to the physio work you had done which i you know definitely think played a part for sure but i just remember the amount of like passion and intent that yeah, you would carry had, into literally every single fight. training session you i had fight fight is an understatement <laughs> <laughs> i think everyone who knows you will attest to that um drive determination grit passion these are words that come to my come to my mind you know but intent in every single training session that to me is when we got to that September comp and you, 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 you took your, your, your third pull. Was it your third pull? Did we hit yeah, the third pull? We yeah, we did. We, we did. We took that third pull and, and, and we had oh. the competition that like in, you know, only a matter of really weeks prior, yeah. you know, we were unsure about walking, you know? So, so to be there on, uh, on competition day was, yeah, it was incredible. And, and then, you know, to, to, to go through everything you went through after that, which was arguably, you know, you, you know, you, you said yourself worse than, yeah. than before, but come back with this new perspective. Like, like you have trained since then as well, you know, since that December comp, you have trained, you've had oh, good, yeah. good training, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, I'm honestly a bit lost for words and I, I'm kind of rambling a small bit, but it's been such an honor and such a pleasure to be along for for the ride so far and i'm so fortunate to be where i am and i cannot wait for the next 20 years of of clarice training you sent me a very a very uh a funny message that i took with a pinch of salt but it was something along the lines of like you know if i have to carry you to the platform like you asked me to yeah. carry you to the platform if i had to fact i was like yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> no but i was i was serious like because i was i was like obviously when I was first diagnosed powerlifters with MS like you don't really hear too much about them and I don't I didn't know anyone in the sport with MS so I was like what am I going to do like how, I have no one to kind of connect with on like a one-to-one -one basis about this whole thing and it was just so new to me and it is so different like I know saying that every lifter is different like that that's that's the thing like every lifter is different but a lifter with MS like you can't even put that in on a scale um, that's, a, that's a, its own kettle of fish so I was a bit scared about it and I was scared about what powerlifting like how would that impact my MS or would it impact my MS and uh, yeah I just had no one to connect to connect with on it so I actually reached out to there was a girl she's, a, she's in Australia but I had saw a video of her um, competing and I think as she was approaching like deadlifts her legs went and her coach carried her out. But the thing was, like, she was able to still finish the lift. Like, she was able to complete the lift. She just couldn't feel anything. So, yeah, I thought, you know what? Jesus, if that ever happens to me, Adam, 
carry me to the platform. Like, <laughs> if she can do it, I can do it. I'm like, carry me to the platform. We'll, we'll still, we'll still pull it. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I took that with a pinch of salt anyway. I know you were like, <laughs> absolutely no way is this happening. Like she can't feel her legs. We're just pulling it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's mad. I'm just sitting here thinking about like that, that kind of undertaking, like when you, when you, you gave me, when you came back to me with your, you know, the, the slew of, uh, diagnoses and, and mm. told me you still wanted to, to train and compete you and your situation were one of the driving forces behind my, um, switch, I suppose, to a bottoms up approach to programming, because I remember when, when. I was faced with it at the time. I was like, how, <laughs> like, yeah. what, what do we do here? Is this just going to be like, you know, constant trial and error. And even then, like, how do we make decisions as to what worked? And, and I remember coming, well, I had known of like emerging strategies and, and a bottoms up approach, but I'd never really put much thought into it because what I had been doing at that point worked, you know, but when I, I remember, I remember I watched it was uh, Mike Deshear did a podcast with Derek Everly, I think his name is, or Cleverly maybe. But they talked about a bottoms up approach and having had that experience with you, you were all that was going through my mind while I was listening to that because <laughs> it gave me a way to kind of zero in on what might work. It gave me an approach. Um, an approach towards getting you on the platform like you wanted to and, and giving you this, th these competition experiences that you, that you desired, you know? So it, it's again, until literally right there, I hadn't put those two pieces together, but uh, you're the reason we do bottoms up <laughs> periodization. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You it's go. mad. Like, as I said, like every lifter is different, but I think when you bring in any kind of, disability like it just you know that the difference is then exponential like and we can't there is no way we could have done my training based on like, any kind of generic training you know it is very experimental more so than than anything I think any of us have, will have ever experienced as coaches it's so much more experimental because you have to be not only experimental but you have to be careful <laughs> And you don't know what could cause harm. So you have to be that much more observant of all of the little things, you know, like the tiniest things in, in my training, Adam, you, you caught, you know, you were watching them like a hawk, you know, and we could almost tell like based on kind of where my fatigue was heading and, and just the different kind of markers that we track, like we could almost tell in advance, you know, when I was going to kind of have some, some symptoms pop up again. And we tested that a little bit and I did push the mark on a couple of a blocks because I wanted to test that. I wanted to see how far could I push it before I started feeling symptoms. So from that, you know, we were able to learn a lot, I think. And over the next, we'll say 10 years, we'll have all of this stuff to look back on. And no doubt in my mind that we'll be able to plan the perfect program for myself, pending obviously how the condition progresses over time. But, you know, the, the importance of being able to have that data to, to, to clearly monitor, like that has been game changing for me, not just in powerlifting, but for health in general. Because if we pushed it too far, my legs would be gone for a few days, you know, and I'd be goosed in bed for a while. But if we don't push it hard enough, then I'm not going to progress. So it's kind of like, how do you balance those two spectrums? Because they're just, it's it's a tough one to balance, but. Adam, 10 out of 10, I give you <laughs> all of the credit. You, you smashed that. Uh, it was a joint effort. It was a big joint effort. We, uh, <laughs> we have, like you mentioned, data. Like we, we, I think the, for anyone that's interested in exactly kind of what our approach would be, it's just about keeping a nice balance. Like total training stress will always be moderate to low. You know, so we'll have to change the, 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 the actual training structure as much as we can to, to, to make whatever adaptation we're trying to make. But like the ultimate goal of each training block for you is not like, you know, to blunt force strength adaptation like like it is with everyone else. It's yeah. to make sure you can walk yeah. the next day. That's yeah. the ultimate goal of every single training block. And then hopefully if we can make this adaptation that 
towards strength that we're trying to make Mm -hmm. you know um yeah so moving on from that thank you first of all again for for telling your story incredibly strong um you're still involved in powerlifting we there's another avenue that you you took up as we mentioned 14 months ago you started coaching i did how uh how's that journey been for you so far do you know what it's been the best thing since sliced bread (laughs) i'm loving it i am (laughs) loving it i think like especially with the ms like powerlifting and i i'm a full believer had i not been kind of in in the sport or just generally like in the in the gym looking after my body pre pre any ms symptom i think my outcome from the whole situation would have been 10 times worse i don't think i would have recovered as quick um, and that was acknowledged by the neurologist too he was like look keep doing what you're doing with the strength training because that's paying dividends with how i am and how mobile i am like to look at me you wouldn't think for a second i have a mess I don't look like I have any kind of mobility issues or, or anything. Um, so powerlifting, in a sense, saved me quite a bit. And I definitely just felt this like urge to kind of give back in some way. So to be able to do that, like through coaching, is phenomenal. To be able to help grow the sport a little bit more, phenomenal. To be able to help grow the female participation in the sport, better again, like... You know, when we started Odyssey, or when you started Odyssey, like when we, like in the very early stages, it was just like me. Yeah. I was the only girl. Do you remember that? Like it was just Clarice and a whole lot of testosterone in that group chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think every day I was like, Adam, please get a girl. Like, please get a girl. I remember like promising you every week. I'm yeah. working on it. Like, I swear, on I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. It's happening soon. And then, yeah, like a couple of months later, we did, we did get another girl. And now like there's, yeah, 23, I think. So it's phenomenal growth. But um, yeah, like obviously you gave me the opportunity to start coaching and like I grabbed that bull by the horns and I love it. I love it. Why don't we, why, why don't we um, talk a little bit about how it was to start out, how you started out, you know, what it was like maybe getting your second client and then kind of fast forward to now. How how did you start out? What what was your, your route into coaching? So my first one was Neve. Shout out Neve. Um and obviously like I have and still have so much to learn about the whole thing, but very grateful to her being so open to me being so new to it and just letting me kind of use the opportunity to to learn and, and help her as as I kind of go um and obviously you mentoring me along the way that that played a huge part you know we've we've had many conversations about all of the different things you know that you were just teaching me and uh again thank you for all of that and then getting my second athlete was Kate that was huge because like the first one like I reached out to say look you know I really want to start powerlifting coaching you know would you be interested and kind of vibing with me on this and see how it goes and then Kate like that was the first person to I guess kind of like have that opportunity come to me so that was special like that that was just I smiled that whole week like it was just mad (laughs) Um, and yeah like it's just grown from that so Kate for anyone that doesn't know Kate is my girlfriend she's Kate underscore Odyssey on uh on Instagram but uh I remember it was it was the first lockdown actually yeah. which I cannot believe is a year yeah. ago. How insane is that? Um, it was the first lockdown. We were we had moved out into the countryside. She has a house in the countryside. And we had brought, not much, but we brought all of our gym equipment. <laughs> like we brought, brought the essentials. you know, the essentials. an Ohio power bar, steel plates, yep. a rack, a bench, you know. And uh, so she didn't have much else to do, but I remember because like I'd been trying to get her into powerlifting in some sense for like two years. I'm sure everyone who has a non-powerlifting significant other knows the knows the struggle. <laughs> but um, she said to me one day, she was like, "It was out of the blue as well." It was like, "Adam, I want to start powerlifting," and like I just had this like <laughs> euphoric moment. I felt like it lasted for like an hour. Um. And then she quickly followed it with, will you coach me? And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who has ever coached a loved one knows that it's nine times out of 10, 
a terrible idea, a very, very bad idea. Um, so yeah, we sent her to Clarice and there we go. We, we, we she go. has not, she has not looked back. She's getting a lot more attention as well from you than she would be. From <laughs> <laughs> oh, Adam. So your, so your third client, I suppose. I think it was not long after Case. Yeah, it was Ellen. Mm-hmm. Ellen was the third. And then from there, it's just kind of blown just up. Snowballs like, since then. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it's mad because I don't, like, I'm, I'm so quiet on social media. Like, probably non existent on social media is a better phrase. So I don't market my coaching or anything like that. So when, every time people come to me, I'm like, oh, you know, like I'm just taken aback. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, how do these people even know I exist? Like, what is happening? It's a very, it's very humbling. Like, because obviously when you pick a coach, in my opinion, you know, that's not a short term thing. I think picking a coach is very much a long term vision that, that that person has. And it is a journey. And, you know, there's going to be ups and downs. So the fact that an individual approaches you and and selects you as the person that they choose to guide them in this journey and to help them reach their goals is like to me that that just that just blows my mind every time i don't think that will ever stop blowing my mind you know i think myself and the other the other guys the other odyssey coaches can come together and agree outright that that there's there's a strong case for you being the best of us because of how much you invest (laughs) in this coach athlete relationship adam is smiling with gritted teeth there <laughs> but we've said this we've said that, <laughs> that the amount of, of effort and care that you put into each one of your girls is is amazing and especially with, with studying and, and the accountancy I don't know how you do it but it's I think what you said there really speaks to that that you don't have this big coaching uh, personality on social media but people it's it seemed like every week there was Oh, Clarice has added so and so. Clarice is. Yeah. Like, where are these people coming from? I, I think that. I know. Really I'm asking myself the same question. Like, where are these people coming from? It's like lockdown. It's mid pandemic, and people are like just hopping on the powerlifting. Like, I'm obviously I'm here for it. Like, I love it. So, can I ask Clarice what what's your approach when you when somebody signs up with you? What do you what do you do with them first? What what's your first objective with them? Number one is to obviously connect with them. Uh, start introducing myself because I'm not sure how much they know about me. So I will always reach out to say a friendly hello, slide into the DMs, you know, hey, it's me. <laughs> Welcome to Odyssey. Um, yeah, just get chatting them from the, from the get-go and then obviously get an understanding of what it is they're doing now, where it is they want to go, how they see me being able to assist with that. Um, and I guess kind of right now, one of the hot topics of my conversations with any new athlete is, you know, what access to equipment do you have? What's your, I guess, kind of mentality like right now about the whole situation? How many days do you feel like you'd like to train? You know, what's your lifestyle in general right now? And how can we kind of create the best program for you, given everything that's going on? And yeah, like, I mean, being a coach is one thing, but like being a kind of a lifelong friend mentor like I I very much believe that you know everything that we learn about our athletes and I I love portraying that back to them so every I guess every block analysis that I do I will always share that with them to say look here's what we've learned you know here's what we've learned works for you here's what we've learned it doesn't work for you here's what I'm thinking about go you know going forward into the next block here's my little brainstorm that I'm thinking of, of, of doing and you know, I'll bounce a lot of ideas off them and what they want because I believe that, you know, if, if they're not going to be happy with what I'm giving them, then what's the point? Because they're not going to enjoy the block of training. And if they're not going to enjoy the block of training, I don't think they're going to progress too much. So, yeah, I, I very much kind of, there's a there's a lot of communication there, um, especially, like I know, like I only do kind of weekly check-ins, but all of my girls know that my messages are, always open as are all of years like they're always open for chats and some of the some of my girls aren't even training now but they know to expect a voice note from me on a Sunday like hey how are you <laughs> what's up <laughs> and like no training talk at all but just a general how's life you know mm. uh, I think that's important like they might not be training but I'm still their coach and I'm still their friend so yeah communication is probably my my focus of of, of the whole thing 
I think every single one of us, all, all five of the coaches under Odyssey Strength will agree that um, most of their interactions with at, with their athletes that they coach are just chats. Like, <laughs> yeah. as you mentioned, we do weekly check-ins for our kind of um, our most popular service. Um, but our, of course, our, our, our messages or DMs or whatever platform we, we talk to our athletes on, they're always open during the week, like if they have a question or anything like that. But I'd say I, 90% of my athletes I, I talk to daily, maybe every yeah. second day, yeah. just about nothing, yeah. <laughs> nothing training related. Great weather. Memes, <laughs> yeah. Memes or gaming or, you know, it's, yeah. it's like what we said with, with Katrina, it's very much a, a conversation and I think you you epitomize that like it's it's getting to know the person and it's i suppose you could you could say it's the difference between coaching and, and programming you're not just checking in oh, the yeah. week to measure the metrics and to provide the planets to tap into how they're doing as a person and, and respond to that as well which i, which I love yeah yeah agree absolutely and i just wanted something i was thinking about while you were talking there clarice i want to jump back you, you know to this insane rise you've seen in your in your your clientele i suppose um something i've learned in, in the few years i've been doing this is that uh word of mouth is so unbelievably valuable as a as a form of marketing i suppose um like i've done i've probably in total spent like maybe a thousand euro on like advertising in in different senses and they have netted me close to nothing close to nothing <laughs> solid where, investment <laughs> whereas you you know just doing fantastic work like really great work and and priding yourself on on every single uh interaction with every single athlete and, and really doing your best has netted you this massive like what do we say it was you're working with 12 athletes now? 12 athletes now yeah 12 athletes yeah, now, it's in, mad, in, like... in a year that's one a month yeah. <laughs> like... this time last year it was one so there you go the growth has just been like as i said i'm I'm blown away by it like i, I genuinely have few words other than like well, trying to balance just a small career in accountancy as well things, yeah no like honestly i'm i'm very lucky i'm very lucky to have two jobs and the particular job i'm in like i get to balance or i get to kind of mix my career with my hobby because of the the industry i'm in like in the performance nutrition industry so like it's it's super cool like i'm i'm i would never complain about having two jobs it keeps me on my toes for sure but i learn a great deal from both that i can actually apply to both jobs so why don't we uh why don't you tell us a little bit clarice about your your day job i guess what what what, what does that entail and and uh you mentioned you're working for Columbia sports nutrition what's the yep. What's that like and what's the plan going forward in the next couple of years? So, yeah, right now I'm just a accounting and finance associate. So I'm actually working for, for anyone that doesn't know, Columbia own Optimum Nutrition and a range of other sports nutrition kind of companies like Nutramino. A lot of people hear of Nutramino. Bonnie and Fish is another one. But our biggest one is Optimum Nutrition, especially in the US. And I'm actually working for the US team from ireland right now because i'm stuck with the rona so here i am um but yeah like it's 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 honestly one of the best things i've ever done i never thought going through school i wanted to be an accountant like i knew i liked numbers and i liked business but honestly accounting i was like this is so boring like they definitely just mess on a calculator all day don't want to do that but now i'm like no, this is deadly. Like I get to play a part of optimum nutrition, you know, growing, like expanding that whole kind of business. Like it's just mad. You get to combine, like I'm pretty sure every powerlifter knows of optimum nutrition. So the fact that plus I get discounts, by the way, which is honestly like <laughs> big perks right there. <laughs> but yeah, like it's just super cool to be able to combine, I guess, your knowledge and your passion of a certain industry with. A career not everyone gets to do that so i'm very very lucky that i get to do that in terms of my vision for where i'd like to go i would love to be a financial controller and um, all of my colleagues i think everyone else in the grad program that i'm on right now knows that like i'm very set in stone with with what i want um and yeah i'm planning to to qualify as an accountant this coming september hopefully if i pass my exams my last few exams and then just kind of keep keep growing like within my team where i am um 
hopefully relocate to Chicago pending the Rona and all that shenanigans. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just just kind of grow from there and and grow both careers. That's what I'd like. I'm not sure if if everyone listening knows this because I I didn't know this before I met you, but it's a seven year process. Yeah. So if you count your own, because like your undergrad is like, honestly, not even 50% of the work your undergrad is like 10% of the work to be in an accountant like it's not as if you know you graduate and then boom and I'm an accountant and I'm on like 60 grand a year like that is not what happens guys like it's you do your undergrad whatever like for me it was four years and then um pending what I guess company like not company but like federation you you go with um you your experience required in order to become chartered and the amount of exams you have to do in order to become a chartered accountant it varies but for me like i'm with acca which is the association of certified chartered accountants so uh, in addition to my undergrad obviously i need to have three years of work experience in obviously accounting and then on top of that you have 14 exams to do and pending what you've done in college and stuff you might be lucky and get a few exemptions but a lot of people don't. Now I'm very lucky, NUI Galway, where I went, they were actually unbelievable for their exemptions. So I only had five or five exams to do whilst working. Cause it's very tough. Like you don't actually get that much study leave when you're doing like ACCA or I guess it depends on your company too. But for me, I get four days versus there's another uh, federation like ACA where you get two months. So it's, it's very different. Like it really just depends kind of I guess where your goals are at that particular point in time but um yeah three years 14 exams lucky enough I had five I've got two left one in June one in September and then I should be out the gap done hopefully my salary will double equally <laughs> <laughs> equally that might just be a bit too optimistic but you know I've, a, I've, a girl can uh... dream. I've been hearing about this salary doubling for the entire the longest time. I've known time. You. <laughs> the longest time. I don't know what planet I'm living on. Where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go from, you know, 30K to 60K in a year. Like, it's <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Pipe down, Maybe. Therese. Like, you might need a few years for that. <laughs> uh, you never know if you keep up this rate of, uh, this rate of gain with regards to, to coaching clientele, that salary might be, might be tripling before we know it imagine it's the first thing i would do <laughs> what i would love to do if i won the lottery tomorrow and corona wasn't causing such you know restrictions or whatever what i would do is i would love to have a a gym where i could we could train like power powerlifting because there isn't too much available well there isn't any that you know that i know of in like in my locality that's what i would love to do is i would love to start taking in you know people that don't have the opportunity to go into a gym like a normal commercial gym or whatever you know bring them into this environment coach them train them you know help them with their disabilities that would be unbelievable that's what i would do if i had won the, if i won the euro millions tomorrow so I'm supposed to do that i'd have to start buying a ticket which i never do so that's my first step <laughs> Good <plan. But> yeah <laughs> Clarice, do you have any moments as we'll do both as an athlete and as a coach that kind of stand out to you as, as highlights so far in your, in your coach athlete career. Athlete, my last pull at Ulsters, because that meant everything. Like that was like, just so it, it, there's, there's no words. Like there is no words for that last pull. Like I remember all of the Odyssey gang that were there, like they were all standing up. Like there was no way I was not pulling that, like not just for myself, but for the gang, you know? So that was just huge, especially because of what that meant in terms of where we had come from to where we were, you know, there at that moment in time on a freaking platform, like five months, five, six months post not being able to feel my legs to being able to pull like squat a PR. All, all three lifts were actually competition PRs for me. Mm -hmm. So it was just mad. So that was probably my biggest athlete moment, coach moment. Oh, it's it's a tough one, coach moment. There's so many. I think for me, like as a coach, and you guys will, will, will know this too, but in every athlete, I feel like we can see this kind of change in that person whereby they go from going for being someone that 
is training powerlifting to someone that is an athlete you know they have this different kind of approach to their training they just look different you know their technique and everything might be the exact same but they have this different kind of look in their eyes and they're different it's just a different fight to them and you can see it I, they they can never really see it because obviously they think they're doing the same thing like all the time in terms of how they're moving or whatever but it's something that I have definitely noticed in so many of my girls and every time that happens that to me is like wow that lights a fire in me I'm like yes like let's go like let's you know it just there's something about that moment where you're like this is it you know that's special and that being able to witness that happen every time you feel like wow like I'm doing my job well here you know like look at this person growing look at their confidence that's one thing that I've noticed in all of my girls so far like their, their confidence the more they do it and when they have that moment of going from I'm training the power lifts to I'm an athlete you know look at me you know, look, look look at the work I'm putting in not just in the gym but outside the gym uh, and their confidence and just you, you can see them change not just as an athlete but as a person and for the better and I think as coaches like that's really all that we can can hope for so that to me is and I know that's not one particular moment but that's every time that happens that's a moment you know amazing answer amazing answer Connor, <laughs> Connor thank I'm you give for you... coming to my TED talk <laughs> <laughs> Connor I'm gonna give you the the impossibly hard task of following Clarice on that. Have you got any highlights as both an athlete, because you have a pretty extensive competition history, and as a coach? Um, I mean, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I would feel similarly to to Clarice that it's it's not one standout moment as a coach that that is in your head. I think that would be to do a disservice to the rest of the, the people that you work with. But it is every time you see this this shift in mentality, like going up a gear of not only taking this thing more seriously, but appreciating mm. what happens to them, even outside of the platform and outside of the PRs. I had a moment recently with, with Jack, one of my guys, uh, on a pivot, like a block between blocks that we, we were supposed to, to peek into a test and, and then subsequently PR but there was there was a bit of a hard time at home and, and the test didn't quite go to plan and we had numbers in our head like the two of us for him that what we what we wanted to hit and you know it was a fairly run in the mill pivot block after quite a successful training block and I was like here look I just want you to hit this and he was a bit like oh that's strange and we we had hit this number that was so important to the two of us and he smoked it like really just crushed it and it's that kind of moment that that i really love as well as you know the the confidence and the, and the growing e- even small little things that that show you that um as an athlete i i don't think there is some of my favorite moments have been like my favorite fuck-ups because they've they've taught me the most like making a mess in my first competition will always be there with me because I loved it so much. Um, great. Ulsters as well with you. Amazing. Amazing. Helping everyone out the day before <laughs> to then make a ball. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me jump in as well. Cause I think helping people out is like an understatement for what we did that competition. Uh, like fact. myself and Connor were in the warm up room handling our people and also like accidentally picking up like four or five other people who uh, you know wanted us to load their warm-ups handle their temps <laughs> fun times anyway but it was great but i kind of realized great. the next day when i woke up i was like fuck i'm exhausted and i have to compete today and to go through that especially with with my brother being in the in the same flight i think i don't know what he was he was doing no he was in he was a weight class below for some reason but to, to compete with him was, was a lot of fun. And then to get to my last pull and have no doubt in my mind whatsoever and no to doubt. miss it just by being so exhausted <laughs> and to still look up and say, look, that was fucking great. That was probably a, a highlight, Do you know? Amazing. What about Amazing. you, Adam? I was going to say the exact Ooh, same. It's his turn. The tables have turned. Um, 
How the turntables. I think as a coach, and I think, uh, I think, I think the rest of my athletes will forgive me for giving a specific instance or a specific moment that doesn't include them. Um, is it has to be your third full Clarice at uh, at that September comp, and really, to be honest, the whole comp and th- like every attempt, <laughs> like um, your first attempt, your first squat, it going okay, you know, not dying. Uh, not dying always great. always a plus <laughs> your third pull though was a special one because especially like at the time your dead of technique was different to what it is now but oh, you would... shite. <laughs> <laughs> let's not sugarcoat things adam <laughs> different um that's polite but you would take like eight seconds to break the floor sometimes minimum, <laughs> minimum. <laughs> so that like i remember your second pull you took a long time to break the floor to the point where like in my mind i was like I yeah know, and then put it down too quickly like <laughs> don't know what i was doing <laughs> what do we do here um so yeah it, the third attempt was the same but yeah yeah that has to be mm. that has to be highlight for me and i think we have a picture where you gave me one of the the run and jump hugs <laughs> we do we at do. the end that yeah that that has to be the the highlight of my of my coaching career um as an athlete i don't uh, you know, yeah yeah <laughs> kind of like connor there i guess I, I like i like where i fucked up i think in 2016 i was a memorable fuck up because i for some reason got it in my mind i wasn't very strong i was just, i was not strong at all actually and uh but i i thought at the time i was mad strong and like i was gonna break records and you know competed ipf worlds that year and all the rest of it um so in 2016 i remember watching i think it was brett gibbs i was watching a brett gibbs video and he talked about training heavier than his weight class um and it being good for him so i was like oh my god i want to do that so i like i think i put on like 10 kilos or something and i like i went from like 82 or 83 to 92 or 93 and i was competing in the idfpa at the time um which was a 90 kilo weight class rather than 93 um so i decided yeah i was gonna train up heavier and water cut into competition uh, for some reason and did what i can only describe as like as being like a severe cut like a a very severe cut i I actually only ended up having like about a kilo to to drop i think the night before comp i weighed like 91 which is a lot to to drop anyway but i think i weighed in at 86 i think i dropped about five kilos by accident um and (laughs) the morning of uh, after when i weighed in i was there like (laughs) squirting squeezy honey into my mouth just trying to replenish as much as i could and uh like nearly getting sick every time i tried to swallow it um disgusting. <laughs> forgetting about water forgetting about water so i was just drinking monster forgetting about water and uh awful competition went as bad as it could have been i think i think i my squat was 10 kilos less than my best triple in training um i made the amazing executive uh decision with no handler or coach on the day to just put in one token bench attempt one token bench attempt to to save my energy for deadlifts and then came deadlift time where i just blacked out on my third pull (laughs) on video I can't remember. I, I remember the bar clearing my knees. And then I just remember sitting outside eating sweets. <laughs> Be, actually being fed sweets by, <laughs> by Barry Pickett. Shout out, Barry. Um, it's an important detail. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a highlight <laughs> or a low light. I don't know. No, my most recent competition was a highlight in and of itself because that had been kind of four years in the making i had like lost myself as an athlete and then found myself as an athlete again and um yeah that was that was and and to just be surrounded by everyone literally everyone came down for that one that was uh that was an actual highlight not just 
one to laugh at. <laughs> Even though there was some stuff to laugh at there as well. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't sleep the night before. And uh, third, my second, was it? My, yeah, my second deadlift. Uh, I took Longest a big jump. Longest rep in history. It was 17 seconds. It was a 17 <laughs> second pull. And I was not letting that. I was not letting it go and it was hook grip and everything. And I had like only a few months prior, like full torn both thumbs, but they held up. Um, and the video is so soul crushing to watch because I was not letting that go. And right as I was locking the weight out, there's just a little dip forward. And I actually lock it out too before that or after that dip. But yeah, um, that was a highlight. <laughs> That was a that pretty was good coaching highlight. moment as well, to be fair, because that was, was that the first time I'd handled you or the only time yep. really? And you yep. were such a different person to what I, I thought you would be. And I think you surprised yourself, whereas you were the diff- you were a completely different athlete than you thought you were going to be. I think you had, I'm going to be cool, methodical, and just execute these things cool as a cucumber. And you were going nuts, like you were sniffing at that people in front of you, you were screaming <laughs> and shouting. You had real cringe heavy metal that I listen to all the time on after shitting on it for the last five years. You were yep. a lot of fun. That was a cool And it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, uh, it was totally organic because I had tried to like, like I, I had been training a long time before that. So I had tried being hyped i had tried screaming i had tried fucking sniffing salts and back slaps and, and i hated all of it always and it always ruins like i much prefer and even do still prefer like listening to some especially these days like shite kind of chill poppy music kate just has her playlist on and uh and just doing what i doing what i have to do but on that day yeah it's something just happened it was organic i i was just excited i don't know <laughs> a lot of caffeine too a lot of caffeine but that probably that probably played a part that's probably the main uh, thing right though isn't it like I had, I had a question on this recently to talk about arousal for a set or for a, a competition whether it's better to be calm and controlled or to be hyped up and aggressive and again with salts or with slaps or whatever and i think if it's organic you're you're onto a good you're onto a good run there. Like if if you're not just trying to be hyped up for the sake of it or trying to be super cool and calm for the sake of it, you're probably onto a onto a winner. You know, it has to be genuine. As long as yeah. it's genuine, yeah. then then it's good. Like that is one of the the traps you see people falling into at competitions, um, and also the reason you should get a really good handler for if you ever compete, particularly for your first competition. Someone who is like, has trained themselves through experience to match you, you know, not like, not hype you the way they think they should hype you, but match your energy. Yeah. You you have to get on the same level as the athlete. Like you can't, you know, be doing your own thing or be trying to get them to do your thing. Like you have to be, you have to bring yourself down. As you said, you have to match them. You have to be on their same level. Uh, That's really the best, the the only way you're going to get the best out of the lifter. Because all too often you see at competitions, people who aren't that experienced, like lifters, athletes, who, you know, ask for slaps and ask for mm-hmm. nose torque and, and scream and shout and pace around the place. They have never do that in training, you know, but they see other people in competition doing it and, and they feel like that this is kind of what, you what I'm do. supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. You're going to have but an interesting uh, time, Clarice. Sorry to cut you off, Adam. At your first, okay. where when all your girls compete for the first time. You're going to be tired. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm going to have the, the, the crate of monster will be in the boot of the car ready. I yes. cannot wait for the day that we get to have a competition. I think the next competition that happens, I mean, it's going to look very differently, but I'm excited for it because it's just going to be great. It's going to be so great to see everyone, see everyone because everyone's been wanting to do a competition for so long. You know, people are working away in the background. And I think the day that we get to just, unleash them on the platform like they're gonna go wild like they're gonna have the best time of their lives and yeah i cannot wait to witness it it's gonna be a very different experience for all of us i think um like we've had we've had some big enough competitions i think at that september comp we had nine athletes it was nine yeah and at the time that was like 
a lot. Yeah. You know, the the unis comp was rough. There was a good few more. There was a lot of junior nationals. There was yeah, that's true actually. There was about fifteen, I think, junior nationals. Yeah. Um which was amazing and tiring. But amazing. Um but that um unis competition that was cancelled in twenty twenty, early twenty twenty about this time last year, maybe a couple of weeks beforehand, I think we were set to have, what, what was it, about 25 athletes at that one? If not yeah. 30. 30 is in my it mind. 30 or so. Pushing 30. So the next one. It's going like, to Clarice, be. Clarice has single-handedly doubled our female <laughs> membership. You know? And I think that's something we should say. In, in 2020, uh, it was the, you know, the 20 by 20 initiative. And, and mm-hmm. the initiative was to increase uh, female participation in sports by 20%. I'm right of which we that. needed yeah. one extra person <laughs> of which we needed one extra person that's true so we added 20 um so we far exceeded our own expectations yeah on we that smashed one. it like i think the rate uh, i think there was a, a certain point in time where the rate of our female signups exceeded the male signups like that's insane right now. yeah right now. <laughs> yeah yeah right now like that's happening it's just phenomenal we do love it's to amazing. see it we love to see it so yeah, the next competition. I think uh, if you're if you're listening to this and you're not part of Odyssey, I would probably be on the website ready to buy your ticket because <laughs> I I think they're gonna sell out pretty fast, and I also think three quarters of the the attendees will will have a black T-shirt with this white center logo. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be insane. It is indeed. It is indeed. Connor, is there anything else you'd like to? You'd like to there's a point up. there that I, I that just kind of came into my mind it is the potential to be a big one so please feel free to to just give a short answer or none at all you were you were talking there about the rate of female signups no. compared to the male <laughs> <laughs> that's that's perfect thank you but um when you were coming into powerlifting what kind of idea did you have of it as a sport and how how welcome did how welcoming did you see it as for women because when i when i say it to a lot of people i work with in in just the, the regular gym that i work in they're kind of like, oh jesus is that not a bit mad like is that not a real super testosterone male driven sport and like i think if you look at the irish pf most of the members are women like chaos the gym that i train in, put up a post there not so long ago saying that 70 percent of its members are women and like obviously we know that's the case now but when you were coming into the sport what did you think of it or even the, the girls did you deal with and train what are their thoughts on competing let me sorry just one second let me jump in and just add to your point and say that the gym that i work out of in, in bantry in west cork rpm fitness is 90 90 plus percent female and we we pretty much exclusively do like you know strength training that's that's our main class but anyway sorry go ahead yeah like i think to be honest when i was first getting into i guess strength sports in general uh, in the gym that I was in, in Planet in Galway, like I mostly trained with women. Like the, the, a lot of the strongest women that I, I guess, was witnessing, they were females and they were unbelievable Olympic weightlifters. Um, and Kim Murray it was one of them. And I guess just looking at them, I was like, wow, like this is, this is, this is class. There wasn't any female powerlifters in the gym that I can recall. So I like I really didn't have a clue. Like I was so, yeah, I was I was really clueless. The only powerlifters that I was kind of really, I guess, talking to on a, on a daily basis in the gym was Connor, your brother, and there was like two two or three other lads in the gym as well. But it was myself and Kim. We did that first competition together. Uh, so for me, like I was very lucky that I had someone else going to a competition who it was also her first competition. You know, neither of us, and Kim will say this as well, like neither of us had a clue. You know, we were both going into this competition with like two months of what we thought was prep, you know, a few singles here and there. <laughs> like, you know, we hadn't a clue. And at that competition, I I do actually remember seeing uh, Strength Militia and they there was a lot of females there. And I was like, wow. Like, this is class. Like, that's something I want to be a part of. You know, I want to be a part of a team like that. Like, that inspired me. Um, And then, obviously, looking up to Brona and all of those other girls on the team, like, they're just phenomenal uh, people. And, yeah, just watching that, like, that to me was the first time I had actually seen a bunch of women 
in the gym helping women. That was my first interaction with that. So that was pretty cool that that was my first interaction or that was my first kind of you know, observation of, of women helping women in a gym. Uh, and that, yeah, like that's, it. it's just kind of, I mean, it's sad that I haven't seen that too much, but equally, I don't think I would have changed it because it led me down the path of where I am now, where I'm very much, you know, I want to grow the female participation and it has grown. It has grown tenfold. The last year or two for, for the IPF, for the Irish PF, like females, there's just like 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen that, you know? So it's been, yeah, it's been, it's been very cool to watch the progression uh, of females. And I mean, some of the girls that, you know, we, we see in, in the Federation, like they're stronger than most men I know, you know, they're phenomenal. So yeah, big up the women. It's great that this, this, there, there was, was, and maybe still is a barrier to participation yeah. through this idea of it being a male dominated sport. So to see women yeah. like that doing the insane things that they do is fantastic. And I, and I hope that it just gets increasingly accessible to just general population people who yeah. may be sporty and just want to get a bit stronger or just people who, who are looking to exercise for the first time. It, like it is such an accessible sport in terms of how, how really simple it is and how accessible the equipment is. So I think it's great to, to have these role models and these teams and communities to look towards and say, yeah, I can do that. I want to do that. I think these are exactly. It's perfect. scary. I think as a girl, especially if you're going into a gym by yourself and you just haven't a clue what you're doing, it's scary. Like you, you, you're afraid to go into a room full of lads that are like, you know, in their vest shirts and they're just pumping like sweat and they're just bicep curls everywhere. And you're like, what is going on here? Like, it's just bonkers. So I think it's hugely important that we do have these kind of female representatives and, you know, we, we, we advocate or even, you know, if you're just a powerlifter, if you're just anyone in a gym, like a female in a gym or even a lad in a gym and you like, there's a girl and she's struggling, you know, don't be an asshole, like go and help or go and point her in the right direction. Especially if you're a girl, like girls should help, you know, reach out to other girls, like girls, you know, give, give the girls a hand because it can be very intimidating and, and super scary. So yeah, like even myself, like anytime I've seen a girl in a gym and I can see that she clearly doesn't know what she's doing, you know, approach her in, in a friendly way to be like, oh, like, do you want a hand or, you know, Jesus, you know, it's good to see another girl here. And you just you kind of have this friendly chat and that can develop then into this nice little friendship where, you know, you turn into gym buddies and then you're training together. And next thing you know, like that person knows as much, if not more about the gym than you. And, you know, you've, you've helped get them from being someone that was super shy and timid and just not confident in in themselves at all and what they're doing in the gym to be in one of the most you know carefree doesn't give a shit what the other lads think in the gym like that's 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 pretty cool so I would say that to, to any girls that you know are scared or intimidated to go into a gym don't like just just go for it um and you know don't be afraid to ask for help like there, I'm sure there's always going to be someone that's working in the gym there that you know that's, that's their job to give you a hand like don't be afraid to ask for help would be kind of one of the things that I definitely say, but equally to any other girls that are there that can see a girl struggling or lads that see a girl struggling, you know, don't be a dick. Like everyone should kind of just be nice to everyone, you know? Just be sound. Just be I like sound. That. I like just that advice. Just be sound like. <laughs> <laughs> Transcendental advice. I love there it. There we go. Amazing. Um, I think we'll wrap that up there. That was, that was amazing. Uh, let me just say again, let me part myself and say, Clarice, you, you, you've been a source of inspiration for myself and I'm sure Connor will, will say the same thing. And, and I've spoken to 20 other people who will say that exact same thing. So I appreciate you. I appreciate your strength, your resolve. And I'm so grateful to be a part of part of your journey. I'm so grateful that you, you took on this coaching role and everything is trending the way it is. So I appreciate you. Thanks, guys. Love you, Adam. I appreciate you. Love you, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> Big love amazing so there we have it episode number six of the odyssey podcast done if there's anything you would like us to talk about if there's anyone you would like us to talk to 
please let us know. You can you can contact us all on Instagram. Actually, Clarice, why don't you plug your Instagram? Where can oh, we find Jesus, you? Jesus, what is it? Uh, Clarice uh, underscore Tig. <laughs> I think that's it. Cool. I mean, there isn't too many Clarices. I'm sure you'll find me. C L A R I C E Clarice. That's usually how people remember it. So you are the only Clarice on the Open Powerlifting database. So. <laughs> there we go. The one and go. only. <laughs> there you go. Amazing. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We will see you hopefully within the next seven days. Bye-bye. All the best. See you guys.